So in the previous video, in part one, you walked onto a crime scene and you found that the victim of this crime scene was Georgie. You interviewed a witness and asked who could have killed Georgie. And the witness said Georgie had many enemies and they are Johnny Bravo, John Wick and Ronaldo. These were the three suspects. Now, during part one, uh, your scientist friend told you that the, the, the blood here on the floor was not only the blood from Georgie, the victim, but also the blood from the murderer. So the blood here is from two different people. So obviously, obviously there was a fight. Now, she also said, that, um, your scientist friend also said that the DNA in this blood sample will not be enough to be able to show who the murderer is. So the test, um, the test that will show who the killer is needs more DNA. And so what you do is you put the DNA through something called PCR. Now this PCR, the polymerase chain reaction, is going to turn this little bit of DNA into a whole lot of DNA, millions of copies, only within a few hours. So you can kind of think of it like um, a printer. If you put too little uh, ink into a printer, it will give you a, pl a pretty like blurry image, right? It will not give you a clear image, and that's the same with um, the uh, with uh, showing who the murderer is. The, the there's this machine or this test that will that we'll talk about later called gel electrophoresis, and in order to do this test, you need a lot of DNA. Otherwise, it won't work. And so, therefore, you had to do PCR first to make the DNA a lot. And so, now that we have a whole lot of DNA, we can actually go ahead and do gel electrophoresis to show which of these three people is the murderer. So that's the, that's the purpose of today. That's what we're going to do, be doing in part two. So who do you think it's going to be based off a guess? Who do you think it's going to be, who do you think it's going to be out of these three people? <coughs> so let's get to it. So first I'll use a little like real life situation thing that will be very similar to gel electrophoresis. And if you understand this, Gel electrophoresis should be really, really simple for you. So have you ever seen these kind of like magnets? These really tiny ones that when you put them together, you can make shapes and all that stuff. So pretend you take a big one and a small one. Okay, so this is a big one and this is a small one. Now pretend you put them on one side of a flat surface. So we're putting it on the on this side of this flat table or something. And on the on the other side of the table, you have this magnet. Okay. This magnet is super, super strong, and it's going to pull these two towards itself, okay? Because that's how magnets work, right? Now, which magnet, the big one or the small one, do you think is going to travel the fastest towards this, uh, uh, towards this magnet? So you can imagine it's probably going to be the small one because the small one's super light, so you can imagine it's going to go, going to go really quick towards this magnet. The big one is pretty heavy, so even though it's going to be pulled, it will move pretty slowly until eventually it will get there. Now, let's pretend we're going to add glue to this table. So here we go. Let's say we add a whole bunch of glue. Do you think this will change the situation? Okay, so if you were to use now, let's say Instead of this really big and small magnet, let's use different size magnet. Let's say we use a five piece magnet and a two piece magnet. So this is the bigger one and this is the smaller one. What will happen? What will the glue do? So if you were to put this magnet on this side, the smaller one will probably move, but it will the glue will slow it down a lot. So as it travels, the glue will sl slow it down a bit. So it will still move, but more slowly than it would without the glue, right? So maybe after the same amount of time, um, the two the the, the two-piece magnet will stop here, and then the bigger one will stop here somewhere because it's heavier. Okay, so the glue just slows it down. The heavier one will still travel um, a less distance than the lighter one. Now, okay, so it will be the same thing with this. So pretend we put a three-piece and a two-piece here, and a one-piece and a five-piece there. Now. What will happen? So the one piece will travel the furthest, maybe stop around here. So they, because of the glue, they don't actually reach the magnet because the glue is slowing it down quite a lot. 
and the five-piece one will travel the least, right? The two-piece one is slightly heavier than the one-piece one, so it won't go as far, maybe a little bit short, like here. And then the three-piece one is slightly lighter than the five-piece five one, but slightly heavier than the two-piece one. So maybe it comes down to like here. Now, if you understand this concept, gel electrophoresis will be really, really simple. And just bear in mind, we'll get there soon. But bear this concept in mind, you'll see it matters. So remember how I said <coughs> um, the three suspects were these three people. Now, in order to compare the DNA from the crime scene, the blood we found, to these three suspects, we need to first get their DNA, right? So the crime scene investigator will go to each of these three people's houses and get their DNA maybe in the form of a blood sample. So they'll take their blood so that they can compare the blood sample with science towards the blood at the crime scene. And if it matches one of these three people, we'll know which one it is, right? Let's see. So here we got it. So right now, here we got Ronaldo's DNA, John Wick's DNA, and um, Johnny Bravo's DNA. So. Don't worry, maybe it looks complicated, but it's actually really simple. So just, just uh, pay attention for a second. <clears throat> so Ronaldo's DNA, all these three people's DNA look pretty similar, right? Um, you can see they all have these yellow regions called genes. It's not really yellow, it's just highlighted for the sake of this uh, explanation. So the yellow parts, you can see they're quite short. Maybe here's one, here's another one, here's another one. And they're on the same spots on each person's DNA. So obviously, all individuals don't have the same genes, otherwise we'd look exactly the same. So we all have the same region of DNA, but different variations. So Ronaldo's eye color gene is probably different from um, these two people's genes. Okay, So it's the same gene, meaning this gene codes for eye color, this gene also codes for eye color, and this gene also codes for eye color, but there are slight variations. So the coding is slightly different, which gives them different eye colors. Okay, and maybe this one is for hair color, and then this one is for height. Okay, so genes are coding regions of DNA, which means that they mean something. They code for something that will make you look the way you do or behave the way you do. So that's what genes are. Okay, genes mean something. Now, in between these genes, you can see there's really large region um, in between all the genes. This region is called a non-coding region, it does not code for anything, which means um, it doesn't actually uh, contribute to how you look like or anything like that. At least that's what scientists know right now. They don't believe that it does anything just yet. But it is helpful for one scenario. It's helpful because they can use this in crime scene investigations and stuff like that. Because as you can see here, there is a clear difference between the number of each of these people. So you can see Ronaldo has 10 of these blue ones and 12 of the green ones. John Wick has 14 blue ones, so he has more, but less green ones. So you can see every single individual has a different non-coding DNA. There is slight variations and scientists can use these variations to help them determine who the murderer is. And I'll show you how. Don't worry, it's not complicated. Just keep paying attention. So, let's get to it. So, if you're, if you're wondering what STR is, it's not so important, but you just need to recognize the word. I'll show you here. So, um, all the non-coding DNA, so everything in between the genes, so this region here and this region here, for example, that is called satellite DNA. That's the same as non-coding DNA. There are two types. Uh, STR is one of them, as you can see here. It stands for short tandem repeats, um, and I'll explain that a bit so, uh, shortly. But you don't really need to know so much about these. You just got to be able to recognize them. Um, so don't, wor don't worry about this part too much. Now, so as I said before, uh, Ronaldo has 10 blue ones and 12 green ones. So what I mean by 10 of them is that each block is the same code as the next block. So for example, this one might be CGG, this one might be CGG, next one might be CGG. It just means that it's a short STR, short tandem repeat. It's the same code that repeats a certain amount of times. In Ronaldo, this code repeats 10 times. In 
um, John Wick, it repeats 14 times. So different individuals have different lengths of repeat of this code. So same with the green one. In Ronaldo, this specific code, it can be anything, repeats 12 times. But in John Wick, seven times. Okay, so you can see in different people, it repeats different amount of times. And you'll see why this is super useful for scientists. So now, now I'll explain how it's useful. <clears throat> so there's something called a restriction enzyme. You can think of a restriction enzyme as a scissor. What do scissors do? We all know that scissors cut stuff up, right? Now that's the same thing that's going to happen here. Restriction enzymes behave like scissors. They cut up DNA. They're specifically made to cut up DNA, okay? So what they're going to do is these restriction enzymes, um, the only difference is that these, these scissors are specifically made to cut only on one spot, okay? So... You know, normal scissors, we can use them to cut basically, we can cut up anything. Restriction enzymes behave like scissors, but they can only cut in a specific spot. So, let's say, I'm going to make this up, but um, I don't actually know where they really cut, but I'll make this up for convenience sake. And you don't have to know where they really cut. You don't have to know where they really cut, by the way, for bio, for bio IB. But to understand this, I'll make up a number. So, for example... These enzymes, these restriction enzymes, cut only on the 6th and the 13th repeats. So it will cut every number 6 of these repeats and every number 13, okay? And so you can imagine, after it cuts them up, this DNA won't be so long anymore. It will, it will be a few pieces, right? It will be a few pieces, and each individual will probably have a different length or a different size piece because it won't cut on the same place for, for every individual, and you'll see how. And you'll see why this is super useful for gel electrophoresis that we'll get to here. But don't worry about this image for now. So let's say, so remember I said they cut on the 6th and the 13th repeats. So let's, let's put the scissor wherever those places are. So it's going to cut right here, the 6th, somewhere, somewhere there, it's not exact. Um, and then here, now there's 12, right? So I said they cut on 6 and 13. There's no 13 here or no 13 here. This one ends on 12 and ends on 13, uh, 12 and 10. So there's no 13, but here there's still a 6, so he's still going to cut there. So you can see Ronaldo's DNA was cut into how many pieces? Four pieces. I mean three pieces, this is wrong. So Ronaldo's DNA was cut into three pieces, okay? Um, now how about John Wick's? Let's see, what do you think is going to happen? So it's going to cut on the 6 spot, that's somewhere here. But the difference is that... There's 14 repeats here, so it will cut on the 13th one as well. And then here, there's 7, so it's going to cut on the 6. There's no, there's, no, there's no space for 13 repeats, so it can't cut anywhere else. So you can see John Wicks was actually cut into 4 pieces. 1, 2, 3, 4, right? So this one, will, I put 3 by accident. So 4, okay? So you can see already... This restriction enzyme already caused uh, Ronaldo and John Wick's DNA to be cut differently. Okay, now let's see if how Johnny Bravo's DNA will be cut. So 6 and 13, so it won't cut on this one because there's only 5 repeats, so it's actually not going to cut there. Um, and over here, there's 10, so it's probably going to cut on the 6 repeat. There's no 13, so it can't cut anywhere else. So Johnny Bravo's DNA was only cut into 2 pieces, okay? Just absorb this for a second. So you can see all these three people, all these three people's DNA was cut into different pieces by the same scissor or by the same um, restriction enzyme. And the only reason they were cut differently was because of their um, differences in non-coding DNA, the differences in the amount of STR repeats. Okay? That's the only reason they were cut differently. Now, now you might ask, okay, why do I care about this? Like, what does it do if it's cut differently? Like, how can you see that on a, on a test? Okay, so that's exactly what gel electrophoresis is. Now it should all start coming together. Just keep watching and this should, this should make sense real, uh, real soon. So we're, now we're going to do a thing called gel electrophoresis with this data that we just did. So with these pieces that we just cut up, now we're going to use these pieces and try and show it on a test. Okay, it's going to be very similar to this idea here that I explained. So it should make sense. Now pretend that this, these DNA pieces that we cut up is like a magnet, okay? So we can see Ronaldo has three sort of equally sized magnets. 
you can see this one is pretty pretty long this one is also pretty long this one is pretty long they're all pretty evenly sized right so if we take these three pieces and put them into gel electrophoresis you'll see what happens so first let me explain this machine so this machine is extremely similar to this analogy I used here okay so this positive thing right here this is like the magnet here this is like this magnet okay and this blue thing here this light blue color is like it's like the glue it's like a gel okay and um, and these these little slits here where, where I'm pointing the arrows to these are called sample wells this is like a, a hole they will put they will put um, so for example in Ronaldo's hole they will put his three pieces in uh, John Wick's hole they'll put his four pieces and in um, Johnny Bravo they'll put his two pieces and then in the last hole here they will put the pieces of the DNA found at the crime scene and obviously you can think whatever this one ends up being it should match one of these three people and whichever one it matches that's gonna be the murderer okay so let's we'll see soon who it's gonna be but how does it work so as soon as they turn on this machine this positive electrode or this positive magnet will work and whatever DNA was put in here will now move across towards the other side because DNA is negatively charged and we know negative things like to be attracted towards positive things so the negative DNA will slowly be pulled towards this positive electrode but remember we cut them up so there's gonna be three pieces of DNA in here and they're all slightly different sizes so the heaviest piece will move the least the lightest piece will move the most so you can see these three stripes right here is Ronaldo's three pieces right and we know they're pretty close to each other because they're pretty similar in size I would say this one is probably the shortest this piece right here so it probably traveled the farthest and then I'd say this is probably the heaviest one this this one in the middle so it probably traveled the least okay this is idea kind of makes sense but let's look now at uh, John Wick we can see he has many pieces he has four pieces he doesn't have three but he has one super tiny piece so we can expect that one of the pieces will travel really far which it did see traveled all the way from here to all the way here okay because it's the lightest remember the smallest pieces travel the furthest then we can see there's three other pieces that are sort of similar in size and you can see they ended up right here okay now Johnny Bravo he only had two pieces one pretty small piece as you can sort of see and one really really big piece so you can see the really big piece traveled um, uh, tra didn't travel far at all you see the really big piece traveled only to here you can see the the um, oh yeah by the way uh, and, and then the small piece traveled pretty far like the same as these you can see two pieces and by the way the glue so this blue part is like a gel substance so it behaves like a glue it slows down the traveling of the DNA so remember before I used glue here to show that it's slowing down that's the same thing here this is just to slow down the the traveling because if there was no glue, if there was no gel the, the DNA would travel so fast you won't be able to see any, any results okay and you can if you if you zoom into this into this gel this is what you see so you can imagine it's like a it's like a maze if you really any big things will struggle to travel through here right because all the all the webbing will kind of stop it but anyth anything small might actually be able to fit through the holes and travel further right so this is how it looks like at a microscopic level big things will struggle to travel through this mess but small things will actually travel more easily and that's why it looks like this now this is really all you need to know like if you understand this concept it this is all you this is all you need to be able to uh, need to be able to explain so this process right here is gel electrophoresis this process right here is what you need to do before you do gel electrophoresis because the the whole DNA is too big to be able to work here they need to, they need to cut it up first and by cutting it up it shows that there's differences in the in the people right and by having differences <coughs> the gel electrophoresis will look different for each person and this will help us determine who the murderer is so now finally <coughs> let's look who is how does the how does the gel electrophoresis look of the person of the blood found at the crime scene so who does it match 
you, 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 you think about it for a second. So this wanted person, the DNA, the murderer's DNA found at the crime scene looks like this. And it matches exactly who? It matches exactly John Wick. You can see this means that the DNA found at the crime scene is exactly that of John Wick's. And this means that John Wick was at the crime scene and he is the murderer. So clearly, Georgie, this, the victim, was killed by um, John Wick. And it makes sense because this, like, this guy kills a whole lot of people. We wouldn't think Ronaldo or Johnny Bravo would actually kill somebody. So I hope this makes sense. But typically, what, how they will show this, this data is not on the, on the gel electrophoresis machine itself. They will try and take it out and put it on a plate like this. So on a, on a test, you'll probably see it like this. You won't see it on, on an image like this. You'll see it more on a flat, more clear image like this. So you can see here the suspect, a John Wick, matches clearly the DNA found at the crime scene. And so he must be guilty. So I hope this made, made sense. Like you can see DNA profile. Oh yeah, and by the way, this is called the DNA profile. So a DNA profile is what you have that shows who the murderer is. And obviously you don't have to only use this technique to find murderers. You can also use it to prove paternity because um, families, uh, for example, you may have really similar DNA to your dad. And so when you do this kind of test to show who, who the father is of a certain kid, the person with the closest, the, the, fa um, the potential father who has the closest DNA to the child is probably gonna be the father. Um, so it can be used for many things. So just bear that in mind. So I hope this all made sense. So there's two overall steps. Uh, you need to first do a PCR, which was explained in part one, to be able to get a lot of DNA. And then once you have a lot of DNA, you can do this gel electrophoresis test to determine anything. You can determine the murderer, you can determine who the parent was, and anything like that. So it's really useful. So I hope this all made sense.